people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cena. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cena. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Monday, February 13th, 2023. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Professor of History and African American Studies at the University of Houston, Gerald Horn. On his latest book, Counter Revolution of 1836 Texas, Slavery, and Jim Crow and the Roots of U.S. Fascism. Also on the program, Tiffany McCoy, Advocacy Director with Real Change, will be joining us about the Ending of the voting period for a major housing reform, first of its kind in the nation, in Seattle. Also on the program today, the death toll from the earthquake in Turkey and Syria surpasses 33,000. Expect more. Turkish authorities are now cracking down on contractors who failed to build to code there. Seems a little late. Meanwhile, the alien space invasion has begun. U.S. and Canada have shot down multiple balloons over the weekend. No word on when the full-scale invasion will be starting. (laughs) DOGA's to sue, to halt, JetBlue and Spirit merger, and in the latest round of antitrust action by the Biden administration. Ten years ago, Obama allowed American Airlines and U.S. Airways to merge. Yep. Very big turnaround. Speaking of the Biden administration, they are now approving state's use of Medicaid for food as medicine. Eating well. Uh, IRS has dramatic service improvement in the wake of increased funding. College Board finally hits back versus Florida's ban on AP African American Studies course. Israel expands West Bank settlements in lead up to a vote on politicizing the judiciary there. Now disgraced conservative CPAC leader Matt Schlepp wants to unmask the staffer that he allegedly groped. Good guy. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining us at the beginning of the week. Um, Emma Vigeland is here. Hello. Uh, shopping around for a new wallet after <laughs> the uh, Super Bowl. Uh, tell Chiefs us about good. it. Chiefs were good to me. No, I mean, we'll we'll d- dive deep into this <laughs> on ESPN. But there was a lot of like really interesting political angles, too. I mean, they opened the Super Bowl with a Pat Tillman scholarship, um, the continued uh, bastardization of his memory. Want to dive into that on the on our on ESPN today. Just um, a reminder of Pat yeah. Tillman. He, he was uh, very much against the um, uh, the invasion of of Iraq. Uh, had issues, in fact, uh, to some extent, with what was going on in Afghanistan as well. Um, when he was killed, I remember uh, uh, I was on, we were doing our uh, the majority report on Air America, Janine Garofalo co-host at that time, and she came in that day and was like, something's wrong here. Yeah. And we were like, what do you mean? And she's like, something's wrong. This, I mean, she, she had an incredible intuition about these things. And at first, they claimed that he had been killed uh, in in battle by Iraqis, uh, and ultimately it was found to be f- friendly fire. 
and there's a lot of like a, a let attempted. alone his anti-war stances right. his atheism completely uh whitewashed sort of erased, yeah. erased for the bush administration's purposes and now for the nfl's propaganda purposes notably fox aired it and uh rupert murdoch was sitting with elon musk we'll talk about that too and there was a jesus ad played twice oh. Funded by the Hobby Lobby guy. So lots, actually, of political angles to the Super Bowl last night. No Plus, crypto, though. Yeah, no, no, notably no crypto this year. But um, but yeah, go Chiefs. That was a great game. And we'll be talking to uh, talking about some of that as well here. Um, but uh, first, let's uh, get in. We've been following since... Uh, it's been a week now, I think, uh, since the Ohio train derail derailment. That happened a week ago. Was it Monday? Or I think it was like a week ago Friday. And... Uh, over the weekend, uh, I think it was on Monday, we we took a call from someone living uh, in uh, East uh, Palestine, Ohio, and I think it was on Monday we took that call. Actually, I think it was Wednesday. Cause Maybe was it was by, it, yeah. by Wednesday, um, and we had talked about it, but there was so little information coming out in the first couple of days, and it took them 24 hours to announce the the um, the freight company to announce like you know what how much of what chemicals were there and it's still they're still dribzing and drabbing it out and it turns out you know these chemicals are incredibly carcinogenic uh one of them was essentially mustard gas um and and that that seems to be coming you know continuing unabated this was a, a news report today on WKBN 27 News, just go to uh, the reporter. We don't need the uh, the 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 the, um, the anchors. And the idea that it's taking seven days for this information to be released is absolutely absurd. You've got these um, essentially these chemical bombs being transported through small towns, some maybe bigger uh, towns, maybe bigger cities. We just don't know. And there's just this presumption that like, of course, there are contingency plans. Of course, there, uh, there, there are mechanisms in place that in the event that one of these things blows up for whatever reason. And this is all done with the backdrop, uh, which we talked about three months ago, I guess, was the amazing amount of 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 cuts to the workers on these trains and the attempt to increase their profits by overworking and understaffing uh their their trains and elongating the trains so that they can transport more and more which increases the likelihoods of these kinds of disasters while understaffing at the same time that was part of what the workers were, were speaking about and uh here's this report on on exactly like just a week well really uh nine days later they're finding out that there's even more chemicals oh We now know three more chemicals that were on board the Norfolk Southern train that derailed here in East Palestine just over a week ago. And we're being told that some of those chemicals are dangerous. We basically nuked the town with chemicals so we could get a railroad open. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency sent a letter to Norfolk Southern stating that ethylene glycol monobutyl ether ethylexyl acrylate and isobutylene were also in the rail cars that were derailed, breached, or on fire. Caggiano says ethylexyl acrylate is especially worrisome. He says it's a carcinogen and contact with it can cause burning and irritation in the skin and eyes. Breathing it in can irritate the nose, throat, and cause coughing and shortness of breath. Isobutylene is also known to cause dizziness and drowsiness when inhaled. I was kind of surprised that when they quickly told the people they can go back home, but then said if they feel like they want their uh, their homes tested, uh, they can have them tested. I, I would have far rather they did all the testing. Caggiano says it's possible some of these chemicals could still be present in homes and on objects until you clean them thoroughly. So there's a lot of what ifs, and we're gonna be looking at this thing five, 10, 15, 20 years down the line and wondering, gee, cancer clusters could pop up, you know, well water could go bad. 
Kajiano recommends anyone who's in the East Palestine area get a health checkup. He says get a record now of where your health stands so that moving forward you have documentation of any possibly related effects to the train derailment. In East Palestine, Jennifer. Okay, I mean, absolutely absurd that people would have to do that in this instance, as opposed to getting this uh, this information on day one. Um, aside from the fact that th that these type of things are preventable, um, but again, this is a perfect example of socializing the costs of the enormous profits that these, in this instance, these uh, freight companies are deriving. Here's, here's a second report that came from Fox 8 Ohio again today. Um, and now the, the drinking water is, is at risk. East Palestine Police Department is warning that drinking water may be at risk for some people following last week's train derailment. Officials said that the Portable Well Task Group will be knocking on doors of the homes that they have identified as having that at-risk drinking water wells. The news comes just days after officials gave the all clear for residents to return to their homes following a fiery train derailment on February 3rd. The Ohio EPA is investigating impacts to water and possible remediation, collecting water samples from nearby water streams and sulfur run where a dam was installed to prevent further contamination. Uh, I mean, unbelievable. Yeah. I, when I was with TY this is after they have been allowed to go back to their homes and drink the water. Yeah. When I was with TYT, I did a report uh, on rural Del Delaware of this family that had uh, a ton of cancer, including amputations, young family members dying. Uh, because they were drinking well water they had for a long period of time. They live in rural Delaware, and they were near a chicken processing plant, and the, the runoff was just going directly into the well water. And um, it, clearly it was affecting everybody's health. And that was from chicken processing and that kind of runoff going into the ground for many years. The amount of toxins that will be in the soil and well water for the foreseeable future in this community and in the surrounding towns. I, I, it, it's going to be downplayed, and we won't know the effects for decades at this point. But I, I, I can't even imagine how contaminated that water supply will be, and I wouldn't trust initial tests on this because you've got to just make sure that it's cl it, it's more likely a worst possible case scenario than is going to be at, uh, portrayed at, at first. Well, here's the other part is that they go around, they test the water, and they're still today finding out what new chemicals are in there. The, the way you test water is not, we're just going to do some blanket test on water and see what pops up. That's not the way it works. You need to know what you're testing for. And so if they're still finding out a week, 10 days later, other carcinogenic chemicals that were burning in that um that fire you know they're going to find more by the end of the week and they're going to have to go back and retest the water in the meantime you've got god knows how many uh, uh families people living in these houses what are they supposed to do they can't leave they've got to go to work uh it really is just uh an incredible uh, crap show that the suggestion is uh get your health checked out so you have documentation in case you get cancer from this is, right I right mean, gosh the best and and that presumes that they have access to you know health care and could just take take the day off uh, it's good advice though if that's if that is the case do it but also well, tr course. try to please you know get get out of there if you can the best advice is yeah Get out of there if you can, but it, I mean, most of these people aren't going to be able to. Right. Um. All right, we're gonna uh, get a couple of reads from our sponsor, and we'll be talking to uh, Professor Gerald Horn uh, in just a moment about his latest, "The Counter Revolution of 1836: Texas Slavery and Jim Crow and the Roots of U.S. Fascism." Uh, got a couple of of sponsors today. Um. As you know, uh, job market still going gangbusters. Uh, so if you're looking to hire, you're going to have some healthy competition uh, for some of those uh, those hires that you're looking for. How do you break through the clutter? Attract the most qualified candidates for your business. 
You do it the way that we did it here. Zip Recruiter. It's true. It's true. Uh, right now you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. There are a bunch of ways ZipRecruiter can help you stand out to the right candidates. ZipRecruiter's technology sends you great candidates for your job. You can send a personal invite to your top choices to make an impact. ZipRecruiter also makes it easy for candidates to apply to your job. Uh, they can they can apply one click. Plus, ZipRecruiter uh, offers attention grabbing uh, labels like urgent, training provided, remote, and more that will catch the eye of quality candidates. The big money is also a good one that will attract people. Oh, that's uh, and based upon what I've read about uh, James O'Keefe, also like uh, free tickets to uh, productions that the boss is that he puts in. on. Yeah. yeah. Uh, meanwhile, uh, you can get your uh, jobs. Uh, noticed by the best and brightest candidates with ZipRecruiter. I've used this service before. That's the way we got uh, old Brendan uh, on this program. And we, he's still he's still with us. Uh, you, know, you know, still working for us. I don't know why I call him old. He's one of the youngest people we've had <laughs> outside of Bradley. Uh, but it, it really is incredibly easy to use. Uh, great organizational tools. And we, we, we had a bunch of great candidates. Four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter, they get a quality candidate within the first day. I did. See for yourself. Go to this exclusive web address to try ZipRecruiter for free. ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. Again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. M-A-J-O-R-I-T-Y. ZipRecruiter. It is the smartest way to hire. Also, uh, folks, I've got a good habit. I've been developing a lot more uh, good habits as I get older mm. because you start to realize like you got to, cause yeah. you're, you're running out of time. I'm starting to feel it. Efficiency. Uh, yeah. Well, it's not just efficiency. It's like, I want to extend it for a little bit. Oh, okay. And, um, you can, uh, you know, stave off death with this sponsor. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, well, I'm not saying that. No, that's, I don't think we could say that at all. Sorry, but, sorry. But the point is, I'm trying to stay healthy. I've been told by my doctor I have deficiencies in certain uh, vitamins. And uh, for me, the hardest part has always been, how do I maintain a good regimen of, of taking vitamins and know that um, when I run out of them, I'm not going to forget to get more. Also, the thing is, you want to know... Um, where your uh where your vitamins come from that's the beauty of ritual it takes the guesswork out of the vitamin game they're multivitamin for men based on science to help fill common nutrient gaps in the diet level one up to their nutrient goals it's an all-around win scientifically developed multivitamin with high quality key ingredients in clean bioavailable forms ritual is your new type of two a days Helps you support heart health with omega-3 DHA uh, and normal muscle function and a normal <laughs> immune function with vitamin D3. D3 is super important. That's the one that I've been missing. Plus, they say the omega-3 is good for your, uh, your brain. Mm. Uh, Vegan-friendly. It's non-GMO. It's sugar-free. It's gluten-free. Major allergen-free. Their capsule has a delayed release design to help it make it gentle on an empty stomach, which is good because... Sometimes you forget to take it in the right time. You always have to do it with food. It's pain. Uh, it's got a minty ens uh, essence in every bottle. It makes everything seem fresh. Helps keep your multivitamins uh, a day actually enjoyable. Um, and look, it gives me the vitamins I need. And it delivers it uh, to my house uh, when I run out. So I don't forget because that's how every other vitamin re regime I had ever been on before was I do it. The bottle runs out and then I never do it again. Right. And, and the thing that I can take them whenever uh, I want, as opposed to like at a meal, that's also a thing. Because I can't remember. But that's what the omega-3s are. There you go. I don't know if that's going to help. My <laughs> memory, but. Hey, Essential for Men is a quality multivitamin from a company you can actually trust. And get this, Ritual is offering my listeners 10% off your first three months. Visit ritual.com slash majority to start Ritual or add Essential for Men to your subscription today check it out and lastly uh going to bed at a decent hour doesn't mean you need to get enough sleep because you got to fall asleep and one of the ways that you get prevented from falling asleep too hot too cold not comfy comfy well cozy earth bedding is here it is the softest most luxurious and responsibly sourced bedding on the planet 
Cozy Earth bedding is made using only the finest premium. What do they call it? Viscose, right? Visco uh, yeah, viscous. Yeah, viscous. Viscous. Yeah. It's from it's from bamboo, which is uh, highly is sustainable. It's weed essentially. Uh, top designers choose Cozy Earth. Their bedding is naturally temperature regulating. You're gonna sleep comfy all right year round. That's my favorite thing about it. But you know what? Uh, here's the thing I really like about it. I know you've got a, a, a duvet and a comforter and all yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Their bedding comes in a bunch of different uh, colors. Uh, it's it's beautiful stuff. It's luxurious. I love it. Keeps me cool. But I, I have a new sort of like uh, that uh, thing that I'm fanatic about with Cozy Earth. Their socks. Wow. I did this Cozy Earth socks thing. And Lounge I got wear. a jogger too. Yeah. Uh, but the socks and the jogger, uh, the socks are driving me crazy. I love them. Yeah. They're really soft, but they're durable. And they, they, they're they not super tight around your ankle, but they stay up. Perfect. I know that's a weird thing to get. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you can save 35% right now on Cozy Earth. Hurry, this offer ends soon. Go to CozyEarth.com slash majority. 35% off. Check that out. It's worth it for the, just for the, the sheets, but also get the socks. Do yourself a favor. Go to CozyEarth.com slash majority. Be sure to enter majority at checkout. Save 35%. That's CozyEarth.com slash majority. I wish I knew about that 35% off. Before. I, would, I would buy more. Buy well, more now stock. the viewers know. There you go. That's good for them. All right. We'll put that in the link uh, and uh, the YouTube and the podcast link. All right. Um, we have... Uh, we have them by phone, right? Okay, so we don't need to take a break. I want to welcome to the program Professor Gerald Horn. He is Professor of History and African American Studies at the University of Houston, author of his most recent, The Counter-Revolution of 1836, Texas Slavery and Jim Crow and the Roots of U.S. Fascism. Uh, Professor Horn, I know you're on the road. I really appreciate your, your taking the time today to join us. Um, always a pleasure to have you on the program. I'm here with Emma Viglin. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so you're and 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 we have talked on uh, on multiple occasions over the years on your um, your uh, a couple of your books, and you have been like it seems to me systematically going back and in in some ways taking on the myths of the founding of this country and the development of this country and the pre-founding of this country and, uh, and, and sort of like allowing us to see it through a different lens. Talk about um, when, when we talk about the, the uh, counter, the, the, the Texas revolution, let's, let's start there. What is the prevailing notion of what the Texas revolution was all about? The prevailing notion is that settlers who had roots in the United States rebelled against what they considered to be Mexican tyranny, and that it was not unlike 1776. Now, part of that narrative is accurate. What I mean is that the settlers, led by Sam Houston and Stephen L. Austin and others, who then bequeathed their names to leading cities in what is now a U.S. state. They wanted to continue slavery. Mexico had moved to abolish slavery in the eight, late 1820s under a president of, Mex of our African descent, uh, speaking of Vincente Guerrero. And rather than accede to that uh, particular decision, they rebelled. And then they went on to unleash what was one of the uh, bloodiest, episodes in the history of North America. I'm speaking of the dispossession of the indigenous population. And I think it was so bloody because, to be fair, the settlers in Texas were facing one of the most formidable armed groups of indigenous. I'm speaking of the Comanches. And that was a very volatile, combustible combination, which ultimately led to the landscape being drenched in blood and with the settlers emerging triumphant. So, I mean, uh, so to be clear, I mean, to getting back to sort of like the, the, the prevailing history for a moment, because uh, if I hear you correctly, like the, half the story, you know, w we are br broadly taught half the story, which is that they were rebelling against uh, Mexican tyranny. It's just that the tyranny involved a, uh, an ending of, of slavery. 
and a, um, a, a curbing of the greater um, introduction of slavery from the perspective of, uh, of the people in Texas. So, I mean, what, what, what is the, what was the tyranny without that component, which I think you, you, you make uh, your case for uh, in this book without that component, what was the tyranny uh, uh, ostensibly about? Well, you need to understand that even though Mexico did not necessarily have a reputation for being pro-indigenous, like others, they were reluctant to expend blood and treasure in combating the indigenous so that settlers could be handed their land. And so part of the, quote, tyranny, unquote, was this idea that Mexico was seeking to restrain the settlers from further gobbling up indigenous land. And with regard to your opening statement, I should also say that one of the points that has driven my excavations is that I recall all too well what happened a few decades ago when the United States was instructing many people all around the world, not least in the Balkans, that you have to face your history, no matter how uncomfortable, no matter how distasteful. That's the only way to move forward. Uh, I say physician heal thyself. I think that the United States should face its own history in order to move forward. Well, I mean, I, frankly, I mean, that's my sense of, of uh, you know, the, the, certainly the books that we have talked about on this program that you have written and, and more. Um, and, and, and that's my sense of, 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 of what your work has been about. Um, I mean, that's what your work has been about largely. Well, that is to be sure. And I think, as I pointed out in an article recently, what happens with regard to historians, I understand why this takes place, is that they study systematically over decades a segment of the story. For example, they'll specialize on 1850 to 1865 or 1750 to 1790. But as I pointed out, in this essay that actually appeared in The Nation, the New York-based weekly, what happens is that it reminds me of the jury in the case of black motorist Rodney King. You may recall what happened to him. Uh, he was captured on camera being pummeled and beaten by officers of the law. And what happens is that wily defense lawyers for the officers of the law, they show the jury uh, disconnected snippets and segments of the tape. And that tends to disorient the jury because they say, do you see any offense there? Do you see any offense here? And I think that's what happens with the history of the United States, is that many historians, they focus on what they consider to be an uplifting story. For example, the revolt against British rule in 1776, but then they don't do a follow-up with regard to what unfolds after that. For example, the further movement west, the dispossession of the indigenous, the further growth of enslavement, despite Governor DeSantis saying that the United States was the first abolitionist project, for example. Well, I mean, that's the I mean, that's the, the point there, right? Is like, you know, ostensibly like the, that if you look at just that moment, it is about uh, emancipation and freedom uh, for for people. But then you start to that that story doesn't look doesn't hold up as much when you see what those people go on to do i mean i you know i mean and i think you know folks could look at the when at your book at the at the, at the ch even just at the chapter headings we're, we're talking about the the texas revolution which takes place in 1836 and um that really you you stay in the 1830s uh in your book for three i'd say out of the 23 chapters um and so let's what what is it in the the and you refer to uh the texas revolution and we should be clear this is when texas uh you know uh, gains its independence from uh mexico uh or attempts to uh that that it's a counter-revolution we will, will you talk to us about that concept because i know this is also a concept that you applied to um 1776 as well as uh, you know and we've alluded to it just a little bit as to what the evidence is for that but 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 talk to us as to what what constitutes a counter-revolution well 
hopefully a revolution involves progress, at least for the majority. A counter-revolution involves a dearth of progress. In fact, a dispossession of a significant percentage of the population, for example, the Comanches, the Cato, the Apaches, etc. And then the influx of thousands upon thousands of enslaved Africans, because you need to understand that during the era of Texas independence, 1836 until when it joined the United States in 1845, uh, Texas became a major promoter of the African slave trade. The Lone Star flag could be found off the coast of Southwest Africa. Angola could be found off the uh, shores, excuse me, of Brazil. The largest importer of enslaved Africans could be found off the shores of Cuba, another major importer of enslaved Africans. And so as a black person myself, it's difficult for me to see this secession from Mexico as a step forward when it led directly to the further enslavement of Africans. And then it bears an eerie resemblance to 1861. And generally speaking, there is a consensus today that 1861, that is to say the secession of Dixie from the United States, because Dixie wanted to perpetuate slavery forevermore, was not a revolution. It was not a step forward for humanity. And if you can understand 1861, you ought to be able to understand 1836. And if you understand both, then you get insight into, for example, Senator Ted Cruz of Texas, uh, for example, uh, insight into Governor Greg Abbott of Texas, for example. You get insight into the violence that continues to mark the landscape of Texas, speaking of mass shootings and Uvalde and El Paso uh, most recently. So once again, I think that in order to move forward, we have to understand how we got to this point and happy talk about the glories of Sam Houston and Stephen F. Austin just won't cut it. And, and But 1776 as well, if you don't mind expanding on that point of, of that being counter-revolutionary as well, because that flies in the face, I think, of a lot of American mythology, right? What was 70, 1776 designed to, to do, particularly as it relates to abolition? Well, first of all, you have to understand history. That is to say, there is a gathering opinion amongst historians that what drove 1776 was, A, the fact that London was reluctant to continue expending blood and treasure per the so-called Royal Proclamation of 1763 and fighting the Native Americans and turning over their land to land speculators like George Washington. And then second, London had the seeds, and I stress the seeds, of an abolitionist movement, a movement to abolish slavery. And you need to realize that uh, enslaved Africans, it's probably the most valuable asset uh, in North America. Certainly was the most valuable asset on the eve of the U.S. Civil War in 1860, 1861. And so you have a number of historians who are pointing to land and labor as helping to drive 1776. And this is not just myself. Um, I hope I'm not embarrassing him, but Robert Parkinson of SUNY Binghamton, State University of New York in Binghamton, for example, has written a book much longer than mine that uh, goes into some detail about this, as well as the younger scholar, Nicholas Farrell Bloom, an assistant professor at the University of Rochester. So this is how history works. Uh, Revelations emerge from digging deeper into records. And in my case, the revelation emerges because I was trying to understand not only the Donald Trump phenomenon and how you can reconcile that with the so-called glorious republic that had, had been established reputedly, And also, I was trying to understand the backlash against uh, Mr. Obama, many of whose policies I did not support. But the fact that he probably received more assassination threats than any other modern U.S. president certainly captured my attention. Um, All right, let's talk about those elements. And and so, you know, if people think about this in terms of like, and and I think one of the things that your work, frankly, has helped me uh, understand is, you know, um, history is like looking at the uh almost like the the the, the trails they're not chemtrails of uh of of an air of of a jet going across the sky like you could take one segment you're not going to get an idea of of where that plane has been or where it's going 
Uh, but the the n- the knowledge of where it's been and where it's going, uh, the direction it takes after any given sort of like segment of that trail um, gives you a much better understanding of of who might be on the plane, where the plane's going, uh, where it's been, et cetera, et cetera. So talk about some of the key elements that were there in the lead up to uh, the Texas uh, Revolution. Uh, and then we'll talk about some of those key moments following it that that make this case that it was a counter revolution and that it was um, the the struggle, the impulse for for independence from Mexico was um, at least in the the uh, the, the the leadership of Texas about about getting slaves and expanding slaves and, and, and presumably territory and making money. Well, a- another epical event that's taking place uh, congruent with the unrest among settlers in Texas is the fact that the U.S. president at that moment, Andrew Jackson, was expelling the indigenous population from the southeast quadrant of North America, speaking uh, mostly of Georgia. I'm speaking of the Cherokees. I'm speaking of the Trail of Tears. I'm also speaking of the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, etc. And what happens there is that they're told that what is now Oklahoma would be Indian territory, a sort of Bantustan. Uh, that is to say, uh, the land of the Indians forevermore, as long as the river shall flow and the grass shall grow. But what happens is, if you look more carefully at the history, is that Washington at that point was quite concerned with the growth of Texas. Texas saw itself as a challenger to Washington. And I think that's one of the reasons why you need to talk, take this loose talk about another Texas secession of the 21st century uh, quite seriously. I think that one of the reasons why Texas seceded in its secession from Mexico was not least because it received assistance from France, which France had designs all of its own on North America, and recognized that it made a bad deal when it sold what was called the Louisiana Territory uh, to the Jefferson administration earlier in the century, uh, fundamentally for a song, fundamentally for pennies on the dollar. And so when Jackson places a Native American entity on the northern border of Texas, he's seeking to occupy the settlers in Texas. Uh, He's seeking to prevent their further expansion But alas, that does not work, because what happens subsequently is that Texas is forced to join the Union because it can't stand up to the pressure uh, from the Native Americans, from rebellious Africans, from Mexico, which is welcoming rebellious Africans as they walk across the border into Mexico, leading to major capital loss, not to mention taking the pressure from abolitionist London. But before that event of 1845, you saw Texas in competition with the United States to further denude Mexico by seizing California, uh, which the United States proceeds to do with the war against uh, Mexico in 1846 to 1848. So was there, I mean, what was the motivation of Washington at that time? The, the trail of tears, as, as I understand it, and the, the, the sort of the, the Indian removal act was um, a, a function of, um, uh, elite in, in Georgia and, 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 you know, I guess to some extent, you know, uh, slightly west of that to, to, uh, basically get this really fertile territory. And we've, uh, spoken to a couple of historians who, who explained to us, you know, the, the, um, that vacuum, uh, they were quickly filled with, with slaves. Uh, they, it preceded a huge, uh, expansion of slavery in this country to work the, that, that uh, fertile ground that has now been essentially uh, 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 natives have been uh, ejected from. Um, w- was there also, w- was, did Washington anticipate this will also sort of like put pressure on Texas in a way that will um, make them less of a rival? I mean, was that part of the, the, the thinking uh, from Washington, or was that sort of happenstance? No, I think that was part of the thinking. That is to say, you put this indigenous entity on Texas's northern border, speaking of today's Oklahoma, 
and that will serve to tie down Texas to a certain degree. But one of the points you need to understand about the so-called Indian Removal Act, the Trail of Tears, whereby the indigenous were forced uh, to evacuate their land, is that many of the indigenous, I'm speaking of the Cherokees in the first instance, had moved to assimilate. They had adopted the dress of the settlers. They were engaged in the kind of agriculture that the settlers uh, preferred. Many of them were living in mansions. Many of them had enslaved Africans. They had developed an alphabet. In fact, one of my major sources uh, for this study is the, are the Cherokee newspapers from, from that time, which, of course, are translated into English. And so you mentioned elite opinion, and, of course, uh, Andrew Jackson is part of the elite, but part of the essence of the United States, and this is something that myself and perhaps mainstream historians can agree upon, albeit from different vantage points, is that when these Cherokee were forced to evacuate their mansions, oftentimes you had poor European settlers fresh off the boat who moved in. And so this was part of the essence of what could be called the American dream, so-called. Uh, you arrive on these shores penniless, and before you know it, uh, you have wealth. And be, with a little bit of luck and a lot of pluck, you can accumulate enslaved Africans and accumulate even more wealth. Now, when mainstream historians talk about the so-called American dream, oftentimes they leave out these grimy details, but too often these grimy details are the essence of the story. Well, I, like, what, what kind of numbers are we talking about? And when we, when we say, like, you know, the, the um, uh, you know, peasants coming off the boat taking these mansions. Like, how much of a phenomena was that? And was it enough that, like, um, in, in what, from the perspective of the would-be plantation owners, what was the value of that in terms of their project to, um, to get a hold of those lands in, and to, uh, you know, bring in slavery? Well, if you look at the lottery, for example... <laughs> that is quite a phenomenon in the United States today. Uh, thousands, perhaps millions, participate, but only a handful, maybe 10, 20, 30, actually prevail. But the fact that those 10, 20, 30 actually prevail is enough to keep uh, hundreds of thousands participating. And so even if you're talking about a rather small number of settlers who are able to seize the mansions of the Cherokee, those kinds of stories help to convince many that if they stay in the game, so to speak, that they too can become a big winner. And I think that uh, we would be remiss if we ignored that particular fact. What? Um, so, in 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 furthering the the, the case that uh, the Texas Revolution was a counter revolution, what happens uh, following that? Uh, moment uh, to the uh, essentially the the uh, the war the U.S. war with Mexico and the um, the annexing of of Texas and uh, the uh, the subsequent you know California and uh, annexation and uh, founding of Oklahoma. I mean, what what else? Uh, uh, what else in that period? Um, indicates the the counter revolutionary uh, nature of 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 eighteen thirty six. Well, first of all, uh, Mexico was not reconciled. I should put that up front to the idea that te Texas had seceded, and so there was incessant, constant conflict between Mexico and Texas up until Texas joining the Union. That's one of the reasons it joins the Union because it needs a kind of backup against Mexico. But once it joins the Union, it then pushes for further punishment of Mexico by seizing the prize that is California, now the wealthiest state in the United States of America, by some measures the fifth largest economy on planet Earth has taken a loan. And that seizure of Mexico, all, excuse me, that seizure of California also leads to further depredations inflicted upon the indigenous population. Uh, another historian, speaking of Benjamin Matley of UCLA, uh, has a book where he talks, or he uses the title genocide, quote-unquote, 
to describe what is inflicted upon the indigenous of California, upon the MODOC, M-O-D-O-C. There's a lot of literature on the MODOC War in Northern California, on the Chumash, C-H-U-M-A-S-H, of Southern California, now in, once occupying the lovely spot that is Santa Barbara, for example. And so from the point of view of the indigenous, it's difficult for them, as they survey the, land, survey the landscape, to see the seizure of their land and their dispossession as some sort of grand revolution. Uh, it could only be described as a counter-revolution. Um, w- give us a sense of like how, uh, how, how, how many slaves, how big was slavery through this period in Texas? And when was it at its, uh, w- w- it's, I guess its peak was probably at its end, right? I mean, but what, Wow. Give us a sense of the growth, and particularly the relative growth. You are correct. Its peak was at its end, approximately 1865. Uh, say in 1836, the early 1830s, you're talking about tens of thousands of enslaved Africans. A few decades later, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of enslaved Africans. And, of course, that more or less tracks what's happening in the United States as a whole. That is to say, in the late 18th century, as the United States is getting launched, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of enslaved Africans. By 1860, 1861, you're talking about millions, approximately 4 million, the most valuable asset and the most valuable property uh, in this land. What you also need to realize is that of the Confederate states that seceded in 1861, Texas was the Confederate state least damaged by the ravages of war. I'm sure you're familiar with General Sherman's march to the sea in Georgia, for example, and how he then turns north and devastates South Carolina. Uh, That is part of a pattern in Dixie. And so what happens is that as the slave owners see that slavery is coming to its end, many of them begin to uh, migrate in mass with their enslaved property in tow to Texas, because Texas had this idea that even with the surrender of General Lee in Appomattox in April 1865 and the murder of uh, Abraham Lincoln, that somehow they could continue slavery because France, that nation I mentioned a moment or two ago, had seized the opportunity to take over Mexico uh, as the United States' attention was occupied by internal conflict. And so the idea in Texas was that they would ally with French-occupied Mexico, uh, French-occupied Mexico would uh, reverse the abolitionist decree of the late 1820s, and then slavery would continue to flourish. Now, uh, that uh, idea, fortunately, at least from my point of view, uh, came a cropper, uh, not only because Mexicans under Benito Juarez, a national hero of Mexico uh, to this very day, you know that across from El Paso, Texas, is the Mexican city, uh, Ciudad Juarez, but also, uh, you have black soldiers who arrive in Galveston. Uh, I'm sure you know the story of Juneteenth. But oftentimes what's lo- left out of that story is that these black soldiers are arriving in Galveston in order to execute a pincer's maneuver in league with Benito Juarez and his forces against French-occupied Mexico. And that leads to the ouster of the French puppet Maximilian. And it also leads, fortunately, to the extinction of this dream of continuing slavery through an alliance between independent Texas and independent French-occupied Mexico. In fact, uh, you've been on this program uh, uh, talking to us about Juneteenth. Uh, I guess it was a couple of years ago. Um, but, but but just uh, just so that I'm I'm clear on that, like what was the 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 timing on that in terms of like driving the the French out of uh, out of Mexico and how did what like the to the extent that there was a a, a a fantasy or a dream in Texas that they were going to be able to sort of I guess secede uh, from uh, the U.S. or at the very least um, be outside of their uh, their reach when it comes to slavery in some fashion. Like who was driving that? How long did that last? And and then what happened after that? Uh, that dream, for lack of a better word, dies? Well, first of all, the Emancipation Proclamation, January 1st, 1863, inked by Abraham Lincoln, 
did not necessarily apply to land that was not under Lincoln's jurisdiction. Uh, that is to say, Texas. It has seceded. It had joined another country, speaking of the Confederate States of America. So what happens is that by June 1865 or Juneteenth, you have these men in blue, the U.S. Army, arriving, not necessarily to tell the enslaved, you know what, you people are free and have been since 1863 with the Emancipation Proclamation. They're really coming to enforce the Emancipation Proclamation decree. It would be as if Congress uh, passed a decree saying that slavery in Northwest Africa and Mauritania was null and void. Well, that would not be meaningful unless they put boots on the ground, I guess, to enforce that particular decree. And so that's what was happening with Juneteenth. What happens, as I referenced a moment or two ago, that that combined pressure from Mexico to the south and the Union Army uh, to the north uh, then put so much pressure on the French puppet in Mexico City, Maximilian, uh, that he is driven out of office by 1867. And interestingly enough, uh, he is executed on June 19th, 1867. And as I tell the story, that second Juneteenth, in some ways, was more important to the abolition of slavery finally than the better known Juneteenth, June 19th, 1865. Interesting. And then, so what is then, in, in, in the wake of that, um, and, and particularly of, of Maximilian's uh, um, execution, what happens in Texas that further, I guess, illustrates um, the the impetus behind the, the Texas Revolution or counter-revolution? Well, this brings me to one of the sorriest chapters, I'm afraid to say, in Black American history, because... What happens, as you know, is that uh, with June 19, 1865, at least for a good deal of the United States, the Africans are free. That means they're free to join the U.S. military, which means they're free to join what becomes the Buffalo Soldiers, which means that they then are the tip of the spear in another bloody chapter in the history of Texas, and in fact the history of the United States, as they route the indigenous population and further execute the dispossession of them from their land, uh, particularly the wily Comanches, who I mentioned a moment or two ago, not to mention the Apaches. And that can be fairly said to be not necessarily a step forward for the Comanches and the Caddo and the Apaches to be going down for the count to have their land taken. Uh, it bears the earmarks, in my estimation, of a counter-revolution. Interesting. And so it uh, and and you um, you take this moment up until um, uh, well, I mean, through uh, uh, Reconstruction into Jim Crow. And uh, where does that take us? By the time we get into the early 20s um, and there has been a sort of uh, I guess we've gone through the, sort of the the birth of the lost cause and the, the so-called redemption uh, and we see a rise of, of fascism in the form of, uh, of a super vibrant KKK and um, Confederate statues starting to go up all around the country in those uh, in, in the teens. Um, where what does that show us about what, what had happened in Texas and then where we were headed from there? Well, even though the founder of the Ku Klux Klan, Nathan Bedford Forrest, had roots in Tennessee, and in fact, as I understand it, there was a statue in his honor uh, in Memphis, the recent site of another police killing of a black man until quite recently. But even though the Klan had roots in Tennessee, it probably reached an efflorescence in the Lone Star State, uh, not only because for the longest, and even to this very day, it has the largest black population in the United States of America, but also because it's so sizable, the largest piece of territory in the lower 48. And so you had the flowering of the Ku Klux Klan, uh, Dallas, uh, which, as you know, reaches a certain kind of ignominious level in November 1963 when the U.S. president is shot there, uh, has one of the largest and most sizable Ku Klux Klan chapters. And then what happens as well is that a few decades before the flowering of the uh, second iteration of the Ku Klux Klan of the post-World War I era up until the 1920s, 
is that you have the discovery of oil, which creates these massive fortunes, the notorious Texas oil men, uh, many of whom are still with us. Uh, I noticed that the Kansas City Chiefs won the Super Bowl uh, yesterday, and uh, a descendant of one of these notorious Texas oil men, I'm speaking of H.L. Hunt, uh, Clark Hunt, one of his descendants, uh, is the majority owner of the Kansas City Chiefs. And H.L. Hunt, of course, was a major supporter of Senator Joseph McCarthy in the 1950s. It was said that uh, Mr. McCarthy was the third senator from the state of Texas, H.L. Hunt, uh, helped to fund uh, many uh, ultra rightist causes, uh, particularly on AM radio, uh, particularly with regard to the print press, for example. And then there's the Murchison family, uh, which until recently was the controlling owner, interestingly enough, of the Dallas Cowboys. They had a, that's the professional football team for those not familiar, and they too uh, walked in the footsteps of H.L. Hunt. And then there's the Collins family. Another oil-rich family uh, from the state of Texas, Houston, in their case, uh, Hunt and Murchison had roots in Dallas, for example. And you, you need to recognize that these forces have played a rather uh, conservative, have had a rather conservatizing, conservative impact uh, on the politics of the United States of America, uh, as noted, helping to fund Joseph McCarthy as noted, uh, helping to fund forces even to the right of Joseph McCarthy, if you can believe that. All right, so let me ask you just one more, uh, I guess, a final question that is more about your process, because, I mean, you've written, I, I, I honestly, I, uh, I, 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 at least, I, I think, close to two dozen books, maybe more, three dozen. Um, and I, I remember uh, interviewing you, I don't know, about four or five years ago, uh, when, and I think it was about, uh, it was the counter revolution of 1776. I think it was. And, um, you were talking about how you were going to go. Um, you were, you were almost like working backwards in history. As you, as mm -hmm. you looked at 1776, you realized like, I really need to look at the 1600s to understand mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. 17, um, for folks out there who want to, uh, what one I'm curious about, you know, that, that process, like, how do you, how do you decide what, what, what part of, 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 a, of a timeline of history, I guess, do you need to examine to understand the timeline that you have just uh, examined? And as a second part of that question, if, if if someone wants to understand really the development of these uh, milestones or uh, events in American history, how would you recommend they approach it in terms of, let's say, reading your books? Well, that's an easy question because I wrote a book a couple of years ago on the 16th century, the 1500s, and that book has a lot of English history in it, particularly English conflict with the Scots and the Irish, conflict between the Catholics and the Protestants, conflicts between the Jewish population of the British Isles and the Christian population of the British Isles, conflict between Christians in Europe and the Muslim power then ascendant, which was Ottoman Turkey. And to me, that serves as the backdrop for the expansion of London while we're sitting here in North America speaking English on this very day. Now, I have to confess that uh, that book deals with the post-1492 period, although uh, I do administer a glancing blow, say, to what in many ways triggers uh, 1492, which is 1453 when the Ottoman Turks, or the Muslims, uh, as you could call them in a colloquial sense, uh, oust the Christians in a colloquial sense from what is now Istanbul. However, I'm, I'm sort of stopped there. I don't, I don't think I'm going to go back before 1453. Although, if you look at that 16th century book aforementioned, you'll see that there's a lot of history about the expulsion of the Jewish population of England at the end of the 13th century, which I point out as somewhat contradictory with how England tends to embrace the Jewish population in subsequent centuries, 
And I try to point to that as a factor in unlocking uh, this question, this conundrum of how and why it is that for in most of the Americas, people speak either Spanish or Portuguese, yet in this country in which we're living in, people speak English. And I think that it has something to do with the fact that London, uh, unlike the Spanish, which engaged in an inquisition, drove out the Jewish population, drove out the Muslim population, uh, you saw that London, after expelling the Jewish population at the end of the 13th century, uh, then began to embrace them, not necessarily, in my opinion, because they were good guys, but they didn't have that many options, because they were up against a formidable Catholic force in terms of the Iberian powers, and they needed every warm body they could rustle up. I don't think you're going to stop. Uh, I think you're going to keep going back, personally. <laughs> That'd be my guess. But right now, for like, so uh, the it, you would start with the dawning of the apocalypse, then go into the apocalypse uh, of settler mm -hmm. colonialism, uh, and then mm -hmm. uh, the uh, would that be then the the counter revolution of 1776? Um, yes, those would be the first and, three. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. And then I would go into my book on on Haiti because Haiti. Uh, uh, upsets the apple cart. Right. Uh, when when you have the enslaved revolt and <laughs> toss out the enslavers, and in fact uh, try to liquidate a goodly number of the enslavers, that has shockwaves throughout the hemisphere and leads directly to the growth of an abolitionist movement, which ultimately reaches London in full force, leading London to abolish slavery by the 1830s and then put pressure on the United States accordingly to do the same thing. So the Haitian, my book on the Haitian Revolution, I think, is, is part of the key in terms of this whole series of books. All right, I have one more question for you, I'm sorry, because I think, you know, one of the things I, I really do appreciate about your work is that uh, it not only teaches specific history, but it also, it, it, it for me anyways, it has really taught me about the, the discipline of history. Uh, of 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 like uh, of an approach to history if there was like d uh, i guess this is this is again a two-parter and then i promise um <laughs> if, if, do you think that you i mean you look at these sort of strands of history that that go through time that tell a story about what's happening at any given time by we, you know by contextualizing it um, with the history of a, a, a specific lens, is there, do you, do you, do you accept that, that a, it's a specific lens and B, if you do, is there another lens that you think that application of your perspective of history could also be, um, could be applied to that same type of like notion of history? Well, I hope I understand the question, and if I, my answer is non-responsive, feel free to follow up. I, I think one of the things I try to do, as my previous remarks indicate, is that I try to do macro history. You notice that in talking about some of these events, I'm talking about Ottoman Turkey, I'm talking about Spain and Portugal, I'm talking about the anti-Semitism, I'm talking about Muslims, and with regard to Texas, I'm talking about France. Now, there's a case to be made for not taking that approach, we're doing a kind of micro history. And, and, and I welcome that kind of history because if you look at my footnotes, a lot of my sources come from these micro histories, except I try to put it into a, a larger scenario, for example. So I think that both approaches are necessary. However, I think the pendulum, at least in the United States, has swung too far away from the kind of macro history that I'm doing and away from answering or asking these bigger questions which I understand, because look at what's happening. Look at Governor DeSantis of Florida. Look at how he's tied the college board up into knots right. by getting them to retreat from their advanced placement course in African-American studies. And nobody wants to be under the gun. I understand that. But I think that if we're going to fulfill our promise and move forward, we're going to have to have different questions posed and different answers that emerge. I guess, I guess, I mean, I think that, that, that answers my question on some level, I guess, uh, just to sort of like uh, clarify a little bit too, like, you know, one could say that one could do a macro history, a macro, let's say intellectual history, 
one that doesn't mm-hmm. necessarily deal with um you know sort of the uh the, the the power struggles or the use of like different um tribal or ethnic or national or racial or geographic um uh, mm-hmm. relations you know that uh but but maybe that's all of of a part i mean and, and you know maybe the one could look at it from just the perspective exclusively of i don't know money uh, although I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, I mean, is that, do, do you think that's, that's possible or is that, is that something that you try and sort of, um, create into a, a holistic strand that goes through, through time? Well, certainly, uh, I've benefited enormously from studies that look at economic and financial factors. For example, uh, making profit from land. Recall that I just suggested right. that that was a motive force of 1776. And as, as I said, as I, as I write history, uh, to a certain extent, I'm looking at primary sources. I'm looking at diaries, and I'm looking at newspapers and government documents. But on another level, I'm looking at what other scholars have written and trying to extract nuggets and jewels from their work. And with regard to the latter, as I suggested, many of these are narrowly focused studies. Uh, on maybe even an individual with their lauding, like Thomas Jefferson. But then I go into their work and try to extract something that will be useful from my work. Well, it's uh, fascinating stuff. Gerald Horn, professor of history, African-American studies at the University of Houston. Uh, his latest is The Counter-Revolution of 1836, Texas Slavery and Jim Crow, and the Roots of U.S. Fascism. Thanks so much for your time today. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me. All right, folks, um, we're going to uh, we're going to take a quick break. Um, we uh, no longer have uh, Tiffany McCoy, who's the advocacy director with Real Change. We have now uh, Camille Gix. She is a member of the initiative of the I-135 Steering Committee at House of Our Neighbors. This is the uh, the political committee for Real Change. Uh, she will uh, explain to us what this housing initiative is in C- in in seattle mm-hmm. uh today is the last day i believe or tomorrow is the tomorrow is the last day that you can vote on this she will explain that to us and more we're going to take a quick break we'll come back to her we're going to delay the fun half okay We are back. Sam Cedar, Emma Viglin on the Majority Report. Joining us now, Camille Gix. She is a member of the initiative uh, I-135 Steering Committee at the House of Our Neighbors and the Political Committee, which is the Political Committee for uh, Real Change, a non uh, nonprofit in uh, Seattle. Uh, Camille, welcome to the program. Thank you. All right. So, Camille, give us a sense. Like, First off, what is what is this initiative I-135? Yeah, so I-135 is a community-led citizens initiative that uh, would create what would be called the Seattle Social Housing Developer, which is uh, would be a new public development authority in the city of Seattle to build, create, uh, purchase, and maintain social housing, which is defined as permanently affordable, publicly owned, cross-class housing uh, that is led by the residents who live in it. Is there a um, would, would this initiative not only create the agency, I guess, would it provide funding and would it uh, create some type of parameters for how much housing it should build? And, and like, and if so, what would those parameters be? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So the initiative itself only sets up the developer. Um, there were a number of Washington state laws that prohibited us from including funding directly in the initiative. So um, while we initially set out to attach a progressive revenue source to the initiative, we learned fairly early on in the drafting process that we couldn't do that for a bunch of legal reasons. Um, so our coalition intends to stay together as we uh, move forward after this is hopefully passed so that we can uh, create a new progressive revenue source that would uh, help to fund it. And then there are no specific parameters of how much housing this should build. Um, the idea is that this is being set up and it will exist in perpetuity. So um, we hope that it can, you know, over time begin to uh, make more of our housing stock a public good. Um, so, you know, taking housing off of the private market when it goes up for sale and putting it on to uh, into the social housing market so that we can have housing more as a public good in Seattle so that more people can afford to live here. Does it does it have a mandated um, like goals like what's to so if I understand correctly, it's you're setting up the entity that will um, execute uh, the, the, this program of housing. And, and I'm going to ask you in a minute to, to explain the, the housing a little bit more. And then I guess like part two is getting the funding for this entity to execute these things. Does it have is it is it. Does it have a mandate as to, you know, how much it should at least endeavor or aspire to create? Uh, and so that the funding matches that, or is it the funding the creates the, the mandate essentially as to what its, its aspirations and goals are? Yeah. Um, so it is not, yeah, there's no, no mandate on how much it should create. Um, it will be set up very much like, so it's uh, under Washington State's Public Development Authority rules. Uh, it'll be look a lot like the Pike Place Market, which is our most kind of nationally famous public development authority. Um, the Pike Place Market uh, has been around for a long time, and over time they've you know developed more and created more of a community resource in the Pike Place Market. Um, and so this, yeah, like I said, the uh, Development Authority will be set up. And then we're going to go after a progressive revenue source. Um, and then the amount of housing that the developer creates will be dependent on what revenue it ends up getting if we're able to pass the revenue source that we have in mind. Um, and it also the other thing that we, we couldn't mandate specifically how much housing because um, much like a lot of the country, Washington State and the city of Seattle have really restrictive zoning laws. And so we're our coalition is actively working on changing those as well um, on kind of uh, on a parallel uh, manner. But um, until we're able to change zoning laws across the city of Seattle, it's hard to say exactly how much housing we can build because that only about 30% of Seattle's landmass is available for multifamily housing. And so we have to change our zoning laws to ensure that this can be built across the city. How much of these guardrails and these kinds of hurdles that you've had to overcome to, to, to put this together influence the way that this is structured uh, is specifically? Because my understanding is, is that this housing project would be uh, mixed income and it's uh, different than some uh, a lot of other public housing developments throughout uh, the country. So can you expand on that? Yeah, yeah. So the mixed income component is, a, is I think, what um, a lot of people kind of are confused by, but it's also like one of the most exciting components of this. Um, so in the United States, we've historically, our public housing has been dedicated to only people making below 50% of the area median income for their city, um, which makes it really difficult to maintain in the long term because our federal government does not frankly, put enough funding into public housing. And so um, because 50% of the area median income, those rental rates are not able to provide enough to operate. And it's super reliant on the federal government to provide subsidies, which it doesn't really do. And it hasn't done since the 80s. Um, and so this model of housing income component, it first of all makes housing more as a public good like they do in other countries around the world. Myself and a colleague of mine uh, had the pleasure of visiting Vienna in September to learn about their social housing 
Um, and the fact available across the income spectrum both creates housing as a public good, but it also provides the financing that is necessary for um, maintenance and operations of the building because you have people on the higher end of the income spectrum who are paying higher amounts of rent. Uh, they are able to uh, help to cross subsidize the lower income people that are in those same developments and maintain and operate the housing in the long term. So it kind of does the, these two different things, both providing housing as a public good and creates a more financially self-sustaining uh, housing mechanism than what we've uh, historically done in the U.S. And presumably even the what are the higher rate uh, and higher income uh, folks within this mixed use, uh, mixed uh, income housing will probably be below market rate to some extent anyways, right? Because we don't have a profit motive. We, this, this, this uh, development authority will, will want capital for future um, uh, buildings, but won't need to pay shareholders, won't need to have some type of 10x return or whatever it is that people get on real estate um, and, and to, to pay off. And this will be, and that's the idea. Is there, is there, uh, are, are there any examples in the United States of this or, or is it really just something that you, you, you have to go to Europe to, to, to find? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, it is definitely not just in Europe. We have examples of social housing on pretty much every single continent. Um, there, I was at a panel recently where a professor who studies Taiwan was talking about the Taiwanese version of public housing and social housing. Um, Toronto has their own uh, version. Uh, Uruguay in South America also does social housing. Um, and then even within the United States, we have an example, Montgomery County, Maryland, which is just outside of uh, the District of Columbia. They have, since the 1980s, they basically rebranded their public housing authority to become more like, uh, you know, international social housing. They opened up the housing to a much wider range of incomes and they started funding it through their counties, so their local uh, government as opposed to exclusively through the federal government. And they've been successful in doing this mixed income social housing model for, yeah, 30 years um, to the point that four years ago, their county saw how successful they had been that and they increased their um, debt authority to uh, be able to build more exponentially. And, and to be clear on that, uh, by increasing their debt authority, they can take out loans and essentially mortgages and uh, and, and just build more uh, or I guess, uh, you know, uh, uh, building loans and they could build more, uh, uh, more, more units. So uh, tell us about the voting period. The voting period ends tomorrow, if I understand. Has this been uh, uh, I'm not familiar with how people vote there. Oh, did we lose her? Uh, Camille, are you back? Are you back? Camille? Are you, are you back? Can you hear us? She can't hear us. Uh, Apologies. Right, I oh, lost connection potentially. Okay. Are you I still? I can't quite hear you. You cannot hear us. Okay. How about now? Can you hear us now? Nope. All right. We're running uh, into problems. We're going to, we're going to try and reconnect with her. Uh, it just give us uh, one second, folks. Uh, but if you are in uh, Seattle and um, or no people in Seattle, raise the yes. Have them uh, get it. We're yeah. we're gonna have her reconnect in just a second. And is she is she reconnecting? I'll just uh, bear with us, folks. <laughs> Important to vote. Yes. Feel free to Google Vienna's social housing things. Is she is she reconnecting? Okay. Uh, just uh, it'll be one more minute. And uh, thanks that. for joining us, folks. Don't forget you can uh, support this program by becoming a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. It is your smart uh, support that makes this show possible. Camille, are you there? Almost. Almost here. Also, uh, Camille. Camille, are you there? 
Camille, she can't hear us. Some issue. Okay. Um, right. well. well, folks, uh, we will get you that uh, voting information. Uh, ask it for that, and we'll uh, repeat but it. Uh, later ballots in the do have to be dropped off by and or postmarked by tomorrow. By tomorrow. So, so Valent you can pick Valentine's up the ballots and you can vote uh, yeah. uh, tomorrow. But if you're in the Seattle area um, and you want to vote in favor of, uh, I'm not sure what the ballot measure is, but we will put that in the description of the YouTube. Uh, 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 podcast and, and when we clip this we'll clip this tonight too yeah. the nation did a, a piece of reflections on vienna's social housing model from tenant advocates too and i mean there's been a lot of coverage of the vienna model so i mean it's nice to at least have something to point to um folks again a reminder your support makes this show possible you can become a member at join the majority report.com when you do you not only help the show survive and thrive but you get the free half free of commercials and you get the fun half and you can I am the show via the app at majority app. The app is free. Everybody can use it. But when you're a member, you can I am us and uh, you can also uh, search the full archives. Um, so check that out. And uh, don't forget just coffee dot co op fair trade coffee, tea or chocolate. Uh, use the coupon code majority you get 10 percent off. And, uh, oh, is today the last day, too, for that, uh, the discount on the um, uh, Sunset suite Sunset Lake at sunsetlakesebaday.com? Yeah, to Valentine's oh, Day. It's Valentine's Day. So check that out. Uh, don't forget sunsetlakesebaday.com. Uh, use the coupon code SWEET and you get uh, any of the uh, stuff where CBD is, um, what do you call it, infused mm -hmm. in there. Uh, a fudge. Be careful of that. Deadly. I mean, not really, but no, in, in a good way. In a good way. Uh, Emma, what's happening on ESVN? I mean, we already got uh, a, yeah, a little bit what of a happened? preview. Any sports this weekend? Yeah, Super Bowl discussion for sure. Um, but also want to dive into some of the uh, political angles from uh, the Super Bowl last night, including the continued efforts to whitewash the legacy of Pat Tillman, who he actually was, who's behind those weird Jesus ads. Uh, also, big Scientology ad, no crypto as well. Honestly, like the Super Bowl is kind of a, there's like a sociological way that you can uh, view all those ads. And we also might talk a little bit about, uh, is ESPN going to be for sale? Is Disney spinning them off? Whoa. Russell Wilson charity scam brett Favre suing for defamation so much to get to so little time youtube.com slash espn show how much do you think uh espn is gonna go for i'm just I don't gonna know. check and see what i get <laughs> because maybe we could just yeah it amazon's gonna buy it guarantee you well, I, I mean i don't know we'll if see they're... about that <laughs> we'll see about that yeah. maybe uh well all right I mean, I'm not going to... I hope Brett Favre suing people goes really poorly for him. Yeah, you know, uh, Discovery's a thing, so he might want to... And he's suing three different people separately, too, so... Pat McAfee, yeah, uh, I think, like, Shannon Sharp and stuff, just for commenting on his... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sounds like we're already getting a preview of a little uh, bit. this week's Matt Leck Media. Um, yeah, sue me, Brett Favre. <laughs> <laughs> That would be that would that would be huge for left record. <laughs> Matt, what is up with Matt Leck Media? Uh, tomorrow night, David Griscom and I are going to be back uh, talking about a number of things. Probably this uh, East Palestine uh, train crash, and uh, we have a guest on Vietnam. So we'll be doing a little bit of uh, Vietnam. Is it Nick Terse? No. It's not Nick Terse. No, um, uh, forgetting the guy's uh, last name, but of uh, the Red and Green podcast. Um, and so, yeah, check that out tomorrow night. What's the uh, the title of the podcast going to be titled uh, uh, tomorrow? Bring it, Favre? Oh, uh, yeah, exactly. Brett Favre. Come, come at me, Brett Favre. Libel, <laughs> it's going to be libelous statements against Brett Favre. <laughs> yeah, click here. Folks, 646-257-3920 is the number. See you in the fun half. You are in for it. All right, folks, 646-257-3920. See you in the fun half. Oh, no. Oh, no. Are you ready? Oh, yeah. Who sent us this? Alpha males are back, 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 back. Boy is back. And the alpha males are back, back. Just as delicious as you could imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 back. Boy is back. And the alpha males are back, back, back.
back. Just wanna degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it to my throat. Alpha males are back, 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 back. Snowflake says what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman. And the alpha males are back, back. Oh no, Sam Cedar! What a wow! What a fucking nightmare! What a nightmare! nightmare. Bring back DJ Danner. Yeah, or a couple of them. Just put them in rotation. DJ Danner. Well, the problem with those is they're like forty-five seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough for the break. Time. That's fucking nonsense. You see, white people doing drugs that look worse than normal white people, and all white people look disgusting. And the alpha males are psych. Fuck them. Fuck them. Snowflake says what? What 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 what